Thank you everyone for joining me. A lot of my expertise, a lot of my clients are children. I love seeing children in practice. I love consulting on children's cases. And here at Diagnostic Solutions Lab, I do clinical consults for practitioners who want to go over their test results of their patients. And I do see about 40 to 50 percent pediatrics in that area. So happy to go over any pediatric cases you need assistance with. But my purpose today is to help you get confidence in your interpretation of pediatric GI map and then translate that into treatment. What I really want to get across today is that treating children can be really, really rewarding, really simple, really easy. I know that you can do it in your practice. I get a lot of people that come in with a lot of intimidation around treating children. Uh, it's not that much different than treating adults, except that children get better faster. Generally, they take less input. They will do the things you ask them to do, and they are pretty fantastic to work with. So you'll see great results with less input and have a lot of fun treating kids. So I want to be here today to give you the permission and the power to treat children in your office, feel competent doing so, and let's get started. Hopefully by the, by the end of the webinar, you'll feel really good seeing your pediatric patients. And when in doubt, I'm here as a consultant. I'm happy to go through your tests with you as well as the rest of the clinical team here at Diagnostic Solutions. We offer complimentary consultations on your tests. So we've got your back. We want to make it easy to work with us. We want to make your clinical experience better and we wanna help you get great results for your patients. So today's outline, we are going to talk about the basics of the infant microbiota, how it develops over the first couple of years. Then we're going to talk about when to test babies, when to test children, and then interpretation. So this will be the bulk of the presentation is how to interpret that GI map for children, what's a little bit different, what's the same, and how you can get more confident looking at GI maps for kids, how to not panic, basically. Then we'll talk a little bit about treatment, about my approach to treatment in practice when it comes to kids. And then we'll go over one to two cases. So the maturation of the infant GI microbiota. So having organisms living in your gut is deeply important. They're important for nutrient metabolism, for maintenance of structural integrity of the mucosa, for the immune system, for protection against pathogens. And the, it's a really symbiotic relationship between the human and the microbiota, the epithelial cells, the lymphoid tissue. So everything is working together. Everything has to mature in a certain way. And there's a lot of inter-individual variation between people, but most people end up at about the same place by about a year and then mature beyond there. So at birth, or pre-birth, sorry, um, what's up for debate? And I won't tell you which side of the debate I'm on, but there may be a microbiome in the uterus. That's one of the theories is there may be exposure to microorganisms before birth. Previously, it was thought that the gut was sterile at birth, but now it's believed that there might be a little bit of a microbiome there to work with that you might be picking up from mother. And then at birth, you've got very low diversity and low complexity. The gut, the GI tract will be colonized with the first abundant microbial population it encounters. So for a spontaneous vaginal delivery, you're gonna get the initial microbiome resembling more the vaginal and intestinal microbiome, whereas for a C-section, you might have more exposure to skin that skin-on-skin -skin contact, that hospital room exposure. And so the operating room might have an influence over your C-section babe. Now, there are things you can do like vaginal seeding. If you know ahead of time you're going to have a C-section, that can be a great way to try to expose babe to a bit more of your vaginal microbiome. Um, but generally, it seems like C-section babes do even out with the spontaneous vaginal delivery babes at around three to five years. So not the end of the world. There's lots of things you can do. And this whole topic, this maturation of the infant microbiome, this could be a whole webinar unto itself. So it is not today. I'm just going to go over it really, really briefly, but know that it's something we could talk about in the future for one to two hours and go really in depth here. So at birth, maybe sterile, probably not, but very low diversity. Um, right after birth, What's a bit surprising is that the population first is these facultative anaerobes, so organisms that can handle a bit of oxygen because the environment is a bit oxygenated. So you're going to have a lot of your pro-inflammatory gram-negative organisms here, some gram-positive, but 
the more inflammatory organisms are going to hang out here. Klebsiella enterobacter, we see lots of E. coli at this stage. And they're going to be consuming some of the oxygen in the environment, kind of paving the way for these obligate anaerobes that really, really need to have an environment with no oxygen. So that's going to be your bifido, your clostridia, bacteroides, sometimes ruminococcus here. Um, now, breast milk is a fantastic food here that can amplify some of these obligate anaerobes, and that's great if you're able to breastfeed. If not, there's definitely ways to work around that. Um, but after that first few weeks, we've got those obligate anaerobes in place. Bifido is really dominating. And then around the time of food introduction, you're going to see another shift in your microbiome. And even before that introduction of foods, there will be genes expressed that can help with carbohydrate fermentation. So our complex carbs, we get the ability to digest them even before we introduce the solids. Uh, but with the introduction of solids, we're going to get some organisms that can really ferment carbohydrates. We may get some butyrate producers. Ideally, we will. Around six months, we'll start getting those organisms showing up. And then the expression of genes in our microbiome are going to work towards carbohydrate metabolism and vitamin biosynthesis, so the production of vitamins from the foods we're eating. Um, also, some genes expressed for xenobiotic detox, so detoxing some of those things that might get into the body from the outside world. And then the next phase is around weaning or after weaning. That's when you're really going to get your, your phyla, the Firmicutes and the Bacteroides, really popping in. They'll be there before, but they really start to dominate at this point. And previously, we've got a lot of actinobacteria. That's where the bifido um, fall under. And then pop these all together. It's, it's been widely believed that around two and a half, three years, the microbiome is fairly stable. And I would say that that is somewhat true, that after a year, after somewhere between one and three years, we do get a fairly stable adult-like microbiome, but we are really still increasing in diversity and richness up until 18. So up through our adolescence, we're still developing our microbiome, so it's not exactly the same as an adult. So while you'll look at a test like GI map and be able to interpret for a seven-year-old, just know that it's not fully developed. So the, the reference ranges will all look the same, but we've got work to do. Um, and still supporting that, avoiding antibiotics, things like that. And so our colonization and maturation of the gut can be affected by a number of things. Um, most significantly, I would say C-section versus vaginal delivery, feeding, hospitalization, antibiotics, things like that. Um, and I won't go into depth here in this webinar, but you can have slower maturation depending on certain inputs younger in life. So when are we going to test children? So we do get this as one of our most frequently asked questions. Can we run this test on children? I would say absolutely. You can run this test on children and you should. Um, it's a fantastic test. It can bring out a lot of information, a lot of surprises. And then one of the hallmarks of the pediatric microbiome is change. So we need to make sure that what we're looking at is more of a chronic state when we run the test. So when it comes to gut symptoms, you know, run this test on Every child has gut symptoms, abdominal pain, loose stools, diarrhea, constipation, things like that. And you are welcome to also try some normal things first. So try the, the normal, simple things first, like probiotics, enzymes, tummy rubs, all that stuff can be tried first. And then if within a month or so you're still having severe issues, then run the test. So I don't think, you know, unless there is some urgency with the case and some children are less well than others, I would say run the test right away on the less well children and then children who are would fall within the well child but have some gas and bloating. I would try some other things first usually and then run the test. So we don't need to over test. Um, sometimes with children they get that exposure to organisms that can be transient and it might lead to over treatment. If you're, if you're over testing you might over treat. But when we see this test for children who truly have issues, you'll see some really interesting things. And then in the extraintestinal world, so things that are outside the gut, really anything, um, bladder stuff, behavioral stuff, um, sleep, growth, appetite stuff, I guess that falls within gut, and then skin. We see a lot of skin cases cross through. So I'd say number one that I see would be eczema in my consulting for kids. 
Now, when it comes to babies, babies under a year, I don't always run this test on babies unless they're very unwell. So I do consult on a lot of cases with extremely unwell babes, babes that are really struggling to thrive. And yes, it can be reasonable to run the test. But even more than the pediatric microbiome, the infant microbiome is changing at such a rapid rate that when you wait for a two-week test to come back, a test that basically takes two weeks to get results back, you might be looking at a totally different gut by the time it comes back. But here at the clinical team, if you call in, we can tease that out and help you interpret. So if you do really have a baby that needs treatment, absolutely run the test, see what we're looking at, and we can fine tune your results. The reference ranges are gonna be very different, and we're gonna look at a few of those today. So trust us at the clinical team to help you with these cases. Don't run this test on well babies. It is not a useful thing to run as a two month baseline for your, for your newborn baby. It is something that should be reserved for quite unwell children. Um, and then we'll take the results from there. So things that we can do before testing or as an alternative to testing, I would always start on things like probiotics and prebiotics enzymes, some GI repair, a little bit of L-glutamine use cautiously, um, glucosamine, things like that. Food eliminations with kids, you will be amazed at how quickly you'll see changes when you take out some common food antigens if they're bothering that child. So in my practice, dairy, eggs, gluten are the highest yield foods to remove, and you'll see changes within two weeks if those are going to be the issue. You see really profound changes. Um, visceral adjustments, um, TCM, things like that, I would not introduce an antimicrobial without testing. Um, but there's lots you can do before testing for a month or two and see if it gets better. So moving on, what is normal? Now we're gonna talk about GI map and go through the different pages, the different sections of GI map and talk about what we are expecting for babes, what we are not expecting and what we might be expecting sometimes, but in clinical cases you know it may come back and you may think okay that could be normal but is it normal in this case so starting with the pathogens because gi map starts with page one as the pathogen page you'll see a lot like this so this was a four-year-old with eczema came up with five pathogens present three out of range and so it can be within the range of normal to see pathogens moving through the gut of children, especially young babes. Um, and especially in the first couple of weeks, we don't run a lot of tests in the first few weeks, but at a certain age, we're not expecting to see anything here. I would say the most normal finding and what I see in most children is no pathogens. Children do have a lot of fecal oral contact. They have a lot of opportunities in daycare and in life if they've got pets to get that exposure. And they put a lot of things in their mouths. They get a lot of oral exposure to things. And so we don't get too, too worried if something like a low-level Giardia swoops through on one test. I would think, okay, well, does it fit clinical context? If it does, maybe we'll address it. If it doesn't leave it, we'll retest later and see how things go. Or treat for a month without addressing the Giardia and then if nothing's changed within a month, then pop in some treatment for Giardia. It's not urgent. But a test that looks like this, so an unwell child with five pathogens, yeah, to me, this isn't normal. Um, maybe I would use antimicrobials, maybe I wouldn't. But this looks like a case where there is a deep imbalance in the gut environment, probably an immaturity, a lack of digestive capacity that's allowing these pathogens to survive and thrive in the gut. So pathogens... Bottom line, can be normal in low levels, can be transient. Always take it in the, in the context of clinical history. Look to page four for things like secretory IgA and calprotectin to see if we might have an acute immune response going on, indicating that it might be a more acute pathogen. So say you just had this E. coli without the C. diff, without the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, just the E. coli 0157. You talk to the family, they say, oh yeah, my daughter had loose stools last week and was feeling unwell. The rest of the family was okay. You looked at page four, secretory IgA is high. Calprotectin may or may not be high. And so that may be an E. coli that was just passing through. So I would be less likely to continue treating it or to treat it in the beginning if it was transient because it, it shouldn't still be present two weeks later, which is when you receive the results. So. 
enough about pathogens here. Moving on to H. pylori. So when it comes to H. pylori, this can affect children. It can affect children in extraintestinal ways, so in non-gut symptoms, and we have presentations on H. pylori in children available. Um, so I won't go deep into that, but when it comes to children, H. pylori can be commensal. It can be protective against some inflammatory and atopic conditions, and so I am less likely to treat it. It's not challenging to treat in children. Often I'll use mastica, which is not water soluble, so you open up a capsule of mastica, chase it with some juice, things get better. The H. pylori doesn't always go away, but symptoms often get better. So you can treat it, but at every level of H. pylori, if we're comparing a child to an adult, I'm more likely to treat the adult than the child at that level. So here, just out of range 1.1 E3, I would most likely treat an adult. If this were the result in a child, I would probably treat them because there's a virulence factor positive, but if there weren't, I would think, hmm, I wonder what we can do to bring down that H. pylori with diet, with lifestyle, with managing the rest of the microbiome and the immune system. So there's lots of different ways to approach this organism. For children, I'm less likely to treat than I am for adults, unless there are profound upper GI symptoms going along with it. And we can always come back and treat it later. There's no urgency with this organism unless there's ulcerations or any greater risk factors. So next section on GI map would be our normal flora. This one I'll spend a bit of time on because it's interesting to me. So normal flora, this is a 10 year old with eczema here that we're looking at. Um, this is low. We've got some seriously low insufficiency dysbiosis here. These should all be present by 10 years old. Now, starting at the top here, back to roides. Um, it, it should colonize fairly early, but it should be in place by about a year in decent levels. Bifido should be high within the first few weeks of birth, and this looks like an okay level of bifido, no issues. Now, Enterococcus, Escherichia lactobacillus, and Enterobacter, so skipping over the Clostridia, those should be some of our earliest colonizers. So we do expect to see those present, especially a nice robust level of lactobacillus would be great. And then Clostridia, same timeline as Bifido. It's gonna come in a couple of weeks after birth. So we are expecting all these things to be here. And then these two keystone species, Acromantia and Fecalobacterium, often will get a test back for a six month old and neither will be present. And that can be really, really normal. So Acromantia and Fecalobacterium both show up, they can show up earlier, but around six months, somewhere between six and 12 is when they begin to colonize. So don't panic if you get a test back for a nine month old and there's no Fecalobacterium. It may indicate a bit of immaturity of the gut, um, maybe not enough plant protein, or plant protein, plant foods in the diet, but it may be a part of the normal development of that person's microbiota because there is a lot of variation between people. So don't panic. Um, a 10 year old, we do want to see acromancia, so that is a bit abnormal to see that not present. Now, when it comes to the phyla, we frequently see higher firmicutes than bacteroidetes in children, especially young, young children. The bacteroidetes colonize by about a year, but I see even after a year that often the levels are a little bit low, and that can reflect on carbohydrate fermentation, mucosal health and other things like inflammation, but it can also be really, really normal. Now for Mickeides come in fairly early and then after weaning, they start to dominate. So these two phyla should be in nice high levels after a babe is weaned. Um, and then in some very unwell infants with a lot of dysbiosis, skin stuff and whatever's going on, but we see some very interesting tests for our young babes sometimes and sometimes you will see a sky high for Mickeides to bacteroidetes ratio so you'll see bacteroidetes somewhere in the e8 level so really really low e8 or e9 and you'll see the for growing really really high and for Mickeides to bacteroidetes ratio can be over 100. Um, don't panic about this don't read too deeply into that ratio just think okay there's dysbiosis what are we going to do to balance it out what are we going to do to help this person in front of us in the office so that's all I wanna say on normal flora for this slide, but I've got a couple other examples because it's fun to look at more examples. So here's a six month old with constipation. Um, now we see that we don't have any acromantia or Fecalobacterium right above that thin black line. That can be normal for a six month old. It'd be great to see it, but we don't totally fine. 
could be very normal. We are potentially expecting to see more bacteroides and more bacteroidetes. So here is a case where that firmicutes to bacteroidetes ratio is really high. So even though the firmicutes are just out of range, uh, which I'm not concerned about in a breastfed baby, the bacteroidetes are significantly low here, and that can be normal-ish, I would say, in this age. I would expect to see a little bit more. The most normal thing is to see bacteroidetes in the lower end of the range, um, but there's nothing drastic I would do here. I do think there's a bit too much overgrowth dysbiosis of the Escherichia and maybe the Enterococcus. So there are some anomalies here that I think are not completely normal, but in a fairly well babe with constipation, my, my inputs, the things that I would do based on these results would not be dramatic. I believe we've got one more normal flora case here. Nope, we don't. So on to opportunistic bacteria. So when babies are very young, you're likely to see a lot more opportunistic growth than you would in older children or adults. So this is the same babe actually, six months old with constipation. We see here quite a bit of growth. We see a lot of bacillus, a lot of enterococcus. That is an exaggerated amount. So it is normal to see in a breastfed babe to see some bacillus, some enterococcus, a bit of staph and strep um, because those are great carbohydrate fermenting organisms and they should be there in babes. But at the E7 and E8 level for bacillus and enterococcus, that is way too much. We see a huge population of pseudomonas here and it can be within normal limits to see some pseudomonas in young people. It's great practice for the immune system. It's good immune exposure of learning self versus non-self and developing that oral tolerance to see some more inflammatory organisms. But this is too much pseudomonas when you find this in an unwell child. Even in a well child, I would think, okay, that's a bit more than I want to see. Let's see how it plays out. But in an unwell child, I may address that. In a six-month-old, I'm very unlikely to use antimicrobials, but it's within the, you know, within the range of things that I may do sometimes. Now we look at the staph and strep, and again, quite a bit higher than I want to see. Now, Methanobacteriaceae, the last one on the list here, um, according to the literature and research, they should not colonize until about a year, but I do see these before a year in almost everybody. So I'm not sure what, what targets they're looking at exactly in the research, but we do see Methanobacteriaceae as a normal finding in everyone, including infants. Now, the second half of the opportunistic bacteria section, the autoimmune triggers, same case, a bit of citrobacter here, just out of range. Again, this could be normal in a well child. It could be just normal practice for the immune system, normal exposures, but in an unwell child, I may address it. And that addressing it may look like giving probiotics. Um, it may look like giving immune support, simple things like that. And now the Prevotella and Fusobacterium, I am expecting to see those again in every person, including infants. So no concerns there, just really that citrobacter. Now we look at opportunistic yeast, and I've kind of copy and pasted two tests here, both with yeast present. So in babies and children, yeast is part of the normal microbiota, but the normal levels of yeast would not show up on our test. So normal levels don't show up. Maybe at the E1 level, the very, very lowest level for candida, I may ignore that, but for a child, especially a symptomatic child, I would be addressing both these levels of yeast. So the top test here was a child with severe eczema. Candida has a strong connection to eczema, and I would be addressing this. The E6 level on our test is really, really high. Um, and for this particular child, there were about five serial tests, all of which had yeast that went down and down and down, but it was a really stubborn population and a really, really fiery red eczema. So we had to work really hard on that yeast. Now the bottom test here, this, this candida is in range, but at the E3 level, I do see this as being significant. We see mood stuff, we see skin stuff, we see gut stuff for kids with, with higher candida. And so I would be addressing this, I wouldn't be ignoring it. Moving on to opportunistic parasites. So we're on to page four of the test already. We've got 
seven opportunistic protozoa which show up very frequently for children. The worms show up infrequently. We don't test for pinworm. That's worth noting that, that uh, stool PCR is not the way to test for pinworm. So if you're looking to figure out what's going on with your patient's pinworm, yes, this test can be really, really relevant because we often see dysbiosis. And when we treat the dysbiosis, the pinworm stops showing up. Um, but you won't find positive or negative pinworm on our test because it's not one of our targets. So back to the protozoa. We see these very frequently for children. If you run a test on three siblings, you'll very often see a combination of the same parasites. So you'll see a lot of diantamoeba, a lot of blastocystis, quite a bit of pentatrichomonas in children. And now with a finding like this, with two parasites out of range, yes, I would address this, depending on the age of the child. And I believe this was a six-year-old we're looking at here. So yes, I would use antimicrobials here. Often you'll see diantamoeba with no symptoms at all. Same with Indolimax, but we do frequently see tummy aches, loose stools, constipation with diantamoeba, uh, skin stuff can be, can be common. Um, so when I find them within range and there's just one parasite, I don't generally address it unless it's blastocystis or diantamoeba. So those two, the blasto and diantamoeba, if they're within range in the thousands or at the E3 level, I do think that's worth addressing. I address parasites if there are more than one parasite, even within range. And then anything out of range, I will address. So the Endolimax, the one that's showing up there, if that were the only finding and it were within range, I wouldn't treat parasites. I would treat the gut, the gut environment. I'd be making it stronger. I'd be looking to see if maybe we needed to make digestion better. Um, any kind of functional gastrointestinal measures we could take would be great. Um, and the Indolimax would likely go away on its own. But if it were diantamoeba as the only finding and it were within range at the E3 level or above, that doesn't tend to go away on its own. It's pretty persistent, pretty tenacious organism. So worth noting that some, some I treat, some I don't, but it's really that blastocystis and the diantamoeba, if you see them, they're gonna stick around. Okay, now digestive health. We've got our steatocrit and our elastase. So steatocrit is our marker for fecal fat. Elastase is our pancreatic marker. And the ranges for these are pretty similar to adults. You, you may see high steatocrit in infants and young children with dysbiosis. So if there is a lot of dysbiosis, if we've got a fairly unwell child, you can see steatocrit pushing at 50%. I've seen 80% once. And that's a lot of fat in the stool. It's not normal. I would say even looking at this at 14%, when the cutoff is 15, that's still a lot of fat in the stool. And this is still somebody that I would want to assist with fat absorption and digestion. Now, a last day is one, healthy children will have at least 200 micrograms per gram. So using that actual range there, the functional range is less understood for children, but I generally use the same as for adults around 500. So in this one particular study, the median for children was at 900. Um, so generally I expect children to have more robust elastase than adults, um, but I use the same ranges. GI markers, I use same ranges here. Occult blood should not be present. Children can have blood in their stool and I have a bit more tolerance for blood in the stool for children if they have severe dysbiosis, you will often see a bit of blood and the next test you won't. And so you can repeat that with an over-the-counter occult blood test. I always think that if you get a positive for occult blood, you should be retesting it. That is a red flag marker. But for children, often that can be very, very transient. Doesn't necessarily require a referral if it's gone on retest. Then beta glucuronidase, same thing. We don't frequently see it out of range for children. This was a child with beta glucuronidase um, moderately out of range, just barely out of range. Um, and for that, I would give some liver support. Some liver support, maybe binders if we're doing a lot of antimicrobial work and depending on the situation, but generally some gentle liver support. Now, immune markers, love these markers. Um, so secretory IgA, we'll see a lot of highs and a lot of lows in children. Um, secretory IgA starts to be produced around two weeks of age, two to three, and then by a month you should have protective levels. You can get secretory IgA from breast milk. 
Um, so this number may be affected by exclusively breastfed babes. Now, interesting about secretory IgA is that it can be affected by stress. So they've shown in children that you can have transient up spikes in secretory IgA in response to acute stress, same as adults, and then long-term chronic stress, including non-responsive caregivers, you can see low secretory IgA. Now, I don't think that means that we can look at a test with a low secretory IgA and then glare at the parents and say, okay, so you're obviously not taking care of your child because they obviously are. Um, but it's just an interesting piece that stress can really affect the immune function of children. So I use generally the same guidelines to interpreting secretory IgA for adults. But this can be low for a number of other reasons, like low commensal, low normal flora, um, low epithelial cell health, so our gut lining, our barrier function issues can affect secretory IgA, nutritional status can affect secretory IgA, and in those cases we would generally see low, but sometimes high, um, food antigen reactions, things like that, um, and then gut permeability will affect that. So with food antigens, you may see a higher secretory IgA. Now, anticholiad and IgA generally interpret about the same as for adults. Now, calprotectin, really interesting here. So, calprotectin and zonulin are the two that you need to have some grace around for children because they can both be blown up, especially under a year. So, calprotectin at birth is going to be much, much, much higher than adults, so up to five times higher. Um, basically, what you see with calprotectin, calprotectin is the reflection of the migration of neutrophils into the gut lumen. So when people are born, infants basically, they don't have any neutrophils in the gut. And so you'll see a higher rate of migration from out of the gut, transcellular migration into the gut. And so you'll have that really, really high calprotectin. Um, Preterm babies are going to have higher permeability, and so they may have even higher calprotectin. The best way to assess calprotectin is with serial measurements, so measure it again and again and again, because within an individual, you're going to see a little bit less change. You may see this transiently spiked up from an infection, um, but it may be a constant. Here at 352, this might be pretty normal for a, a young babe, I don't remember the age of the of the test that I popped in here, but this could be normal. So you're going to see a positive correla correlation with pathogens, um, negative correlation with antibiotics, and then at about a month you're going to see your highest level besides right at birth, and then it goes down. So it's going to decrease between 6 and 12 months, you're going to see this decrease. Higher in breastfed babies, and then there, I was mentioning before, you want to measure serial measurements instead of just one cutoff. So just looking at this and saying 352, uh-oh, I'm using 350 as a cutoff. This is too much. You look at the whole case, look at it over time, see what's going on, see if there's any reason to believe that calprotectin would be elevated from, um, you know, necrotizing enterocolitis, IBD, um, allergies, things like that, or an infection. So take it in the context of clinical history, like everything. Um, and then the suggested ranges from a couple of different studies have compiled this. So under a year, they're suggesting about 350 micrograms per gram as a reference range from one to four, 275. And then after four, same as adults, our range here is a pathological range, 173 micrograms per gram that we use on GI map, but optimal function is gonna be under 50 micrograms per gram. And that's, that's what we do interpret when you call in is we're looking for under 50. So after four, it should not be high. Okay, so calprotectin, to sum it up, can be really normal to be high under four years um, using these general guidelines, but don't freak out if it's higher. So within a healthy population, some babes had calprotectin up in the thousands. I think it was about 1,009 or something like that. Um, so for that individual, that might have been normal. It can be really protective and have some antimicrobial effects. Those neutrophils can be really helpful. Um, and it is just a normal physiologic response for the gut in developing tolerance and protection in that immature gut. Moving on to zonulin. Again, high can be really normal in young people. Um, so the permeability of the gut has to be really tightly regulated because 
a lot of our nutrients are going to be absorbed through there in an immature gut. And so we need to have that permeability between cells to allow nutrients in for growth. But we also need to resist infection. So to have a bit of a leakier gut as a babe increases your nutrient uptake. It helps with the development of immune tolerance. And then on the disadvantage side, it can allow more organisms into the system. So you're going to see this rising through the first six months of life. Some babes will have it high right at birth. Um, premature babes will have it a little bit higher, generally. And it can stay high for about two years. Um, so we use this as a marker for barrier development. It's not necessarily the only marker for a barrier function, but it can be a really useful one combined with calprotectin, combined with clinical history and the rest of the test. Um, but at this level, at 370, that's pretty high. Now, the suggested range from a couple of research studies were under two years of age, less than 200. So this one at 370, probably a bit much. How much would you do about it? Depends on clinical history, presentation, and comfort level of, of yourself and the parents. So we would take it all in clinical history. So when it comes to treatment, my approach is very gentle with children, and that comes from the experience that children don't need a lot to get better. So knowing when to treat things and when to leave them, that takes some finesse, it takes experience, it takes clinical consults, plug for our clinical consults, call us up, we will help you. Um, in deciding you know, when to treat things, what to treat, what to treat first, what to treat second, what to treat third, how long to wait to see benefits. Uh, but this is a really important piece that I don't think I can really impart on you in the next 20 minutes. But there's a lot of variation here depending on what the child is presenting with. Now, I tend to start with gentle therapies over invasive. So if you see Candida, would I be using Saccharomyces and Loracidin or would I be using Nystatin? Again, depends on the clinical urgency. But generally, I would take the gentler approach if we're working with a well child. So if we're working with a very unwell child, you may want to lean more into the more invasive um, interventions that are gonna work quickly and definitely get the job done. Whereas your gentle therapies, they're nice when you have the luxury of time and the luxury of a child that is more on the side of pretty well. So you can work on candida, you can work on blastocystis knowing that that child is still growing at a regular rate. They're still eating, they're still thriving. Um, and then within a month, if you don't see changes, you can amp up your treatment, you can increase your dose, you can change your approach. So minimal input, similar with the gentle. If I'm looking at a case where I could potentially use 10 supplements, I'm gonna use three plus diet, plus manual therapies. Um, and I do see in children that that can make a huge difference. Those manual techniques, so abdominal massage, visceral adjustments, twina, things like that can really help kids. They can help with the nervous system. They can help with sleep. They can help with digestion and emotional processing. Um, a food-based approach is really reasonable for, for children. Now, you'll come across a lot of children that do not have a wide range of foods they can or are willing to eat. That can change with working on the gut, but you work with what you've got. So, if you have a child that only eats three foods, maybe changing the diet isn't the thing you're gonna do right away. Maybe you're gonna work on some other things, but if you can work with foods and food eliminations are amazing for children, even children who are struggling with growth. If you take out one of the foods that is causing GI inflammation and discomfort and maybe causing an aversion to, to eating other foods, you'll see increased growth. So don't be afraid in children that have a pretty broad diet but are still not growing to take out a couple of foods that might be really bothering them even though it's scary. Um, so dosing and delivery we've got a lot of different consider considerations. I favor liquids and chewables I would say in my practice. Um, we've got things like tinctures and glycerates that you can compound with botanicals that are great. Uh, most children are going to prefer the glycerates to the tinctures. Powders can be great I love powders, but then sometimes the volume of liquid that comes with mixing a powder can be a bit much for children, and you may end up with half of your supplement or your powder left at the bottom of a cup, and they won't finish it. So I do find the more concentrated liquids and chewables where you can give them that finite amount, and then it's done, 
um, gives you more confidence knowing that you've got your dose in. And same with smoothies. I do talk to a lot of people that want to mix things into a smoothie, but you have to make sure that smoothie gets finished. Um, teas can be fantastic for children that are willing to drink teas for you know 30 to 60 days in a row. And then capsules. There are a lot of capsules that taste absolutely terrible inside. So knowing what is inside the capsule and what is likely to taste like is very important. But things like Mastica that come in capsules, you can open that up. It doesn't taste too bad. Um, some other things like NAC, not too bad. But then things like berberine, nope, that's not going to work. If you open up a capsule of berberine, uh, you are likely to get some pushback. So knowing all these different dosing strategies can be great. When I had an in-person practice, my whole fridge was full of flavors, flavor testers and bottles and things like that, because children will have their own tastes. You'll have a lot of products rejected, and that can be one of the biggest challenges with treating children is finding things that are palatable. Um, now, when it comes to dosing and delivery, I use this formula, Clark's Rule. It is a fairly crude way of calibrating the dose based on the child's weight. So you take the child's weight in pounds, so say 50 pounds, divide it by 150, which is your pharmacologic adult, and then you multiply that by the adult dose. So say the adult dose for something like Mastica is three grams daily, the child weighs 50 pounds. So 50 pounds divided by 150, that's one third of the adult dose. So one third of three grams is gonna be one gram. So for that 50 pound child, you would give them one gram daily divided of Mastica. And I'm not saying that's the dose you should give a child. I'm saying that theoretically is how Clark's rule would work for that child. Now, not all botanicals are appropriate for children. So use your discretion, look it up. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of botanicals that I do really like. So when it comes to carminatives and gut soothers, so carminatives are going to be botanicals that can regulate the contraction of the gut. So if you've got a child with gas and bloating, abdominal pain, carminatives, that's the action to look for that is really, really soothing. Often it's your botanicals that smell really nice that have that aromatic quality. Um, so we've got a lot of things like chamomile, lemon balm, and peppermint. Those are probably some of my favorites to use for kids. I use a lot of these even before testing just to see if we can make a change. Um, and then some kids will take a bitters, Tincture, some will not, some absolutely love it. Now, normal flora support, I love prebiotics for children. For some, it will increase gas and bloating if they're overgrown. And so use it, use them cautiously. Probiotics are great. Postbiotics, that is the products of probiotics. So things like butyrate can be really, really useful. I use a lot of butyrate in children. Fiber is going to be one of your best supports for the normal flora either dietary fiber or supplemental or both. And then polyphenols, so your nice brightly colored fruits and veg, you can get polyphenol supplements as well. So your, your reds and greens are great. So a normal flora support looks a bit like this, and then sometimes you need to use antimicrobials to support your normal flora, and that's a totally different case. But pure normal flora support, use a lot of these products for kids and they work great. GI repair is often needed for kids. Um, glutamine is one that I give cautiously. So glutamine can convert to glutamate in some people that metabolize it differently. And so what I do for children is, you know, I ask them if they've ever tried glutamine, obviously, and then if they haven't, we'll give the first dose pretty early in the day because that can lead to excitation and we don't want that before bedtime. And then if they tolerate it fine the first time, you can give that glutamine any time of the day you like. Some other things here, again, butyrate, um, collagen, nutrients, and then mitochondrial support can be really great for GI repair. Okay, now digestive support. A lot of digestive support for kids can be in the relaxation realm, kind of the mental emotional realm where we're chewing our food better, taking deep breaths before meals, and even in our young, young children, we can turn these into family games. So reducing our stressors, just relaxing around meals. Um, and then in the supplemental support, digestive enzymes, there's a lot of great chewable comprehensive enzymes. Bitters tincture again, or even a bitters glycerate can be helpful. That bitter flavor is important there, so it can't be too sweet. Immune support is great for children. I use a lot of colostrum and immunoglobulins. 
I do a lot of this with diet, with stress, with sleep, but elderberry, mushroom, and colostrum are three of my favorites for immune support. You can use things like echinacea, um, astragalus, things like that too, but these are my faves. And onto antimicrobials, I won't go in depth in these. We've got a lot of really great commercially available liquid antimicrobial formulae. These are some botanicals that I use a lot for children and you can compound your own glycerates. If you have a good botanical distributor, they can make some really beautiful products for you or you can get commercially available ones to use as indicated and sparingly. And then for diet. So I've said a couple of times, eliminating some foods can be magic for children. It doesn't have to be long-term, just trial and error. You can run a food sensitivity test in children that are a little bit older, maybe over two years old is when I generally do that. I think I've run it as, long, as young as 15 months and gotten great results, but I tend not to run a food sensitivity test in really, really young babes because you can see a lot of change, a lot of influence of maternal diet. Um, so we wanna get basically a plant forward, high fiber, high polyphenol diet, ideally. And there's gonna be a lot of variation. So if you've got a child that's not tolerating fermentable carbohydrates, we're gonna pull those back and that's okay. So this diet piece is gonna be really highly variable, but for an ideal long-term diet, we want that plant forward diet. And that does not mean plant-based or plant exclusive. Um, we wanna have some good quality proteins, either legumes or meats, and then a moderate amount of healthy fats. So just a nice, moderate diet, lots of fruits and veg. And then other therapies, I won't go too deep into these, but there's a lot you can do. In my practice, I do a lot of the emotional release, a lot of the physical stuff, and that can be hugely impactful for children. Okay, so I wanna move on to a case here. We've got a really cute one to start us off as an eight month old, that is not really the picture it's just a picture that i put in for effect so oops let's go back there so severe severe eczema that started around four months old which is probably the most common time i see eczema starting three or four months even before solid introduction so sleep this person had really fussy sleep abdominal distension gas and bloating alternating loose stools and constipation so not totally right in the gut we're looking at somebody with a bit of dysfunction so this babe had been exclusively breastfed spontaneous vaginal delivery with no antibiotics ever and some solids had been introduced with success didn't really change the skin didn't change much but was doing fine on some solids now taking a look at the test we see page one um, enterohemorrhagic E. coli in a big population. So E. coli does have a strong connection with eczema and other atopic or allergic conditions. We often see this running chronically in children. Um, theoretically, it should be a self-limiting organism in a healthy, normal gut. And now here at GI Map, we do not necessarily specialize in healthy, normal guts. We specialize in dysfunctional guts, and that is what we see the most of on our tests. So our results that we see are highly skewed towards dysfunction. And I see enterohemorrhagic E. coli as probably the most common pathogen for children, very, very highly correlated to eczema and other conditions, even anxiety, gut pain, um, loose stools. So again, we'd be looking at clinical history to see if this babe had been unwell in the weeks preceding the test or right after the test. We would look to page four to see what secretory IgA and zonulin and calprotectin are doing to see if we might be suspecting an acute E. coli infection. But generally, I, I do see this chronically in kids um, and I think it's relevant in this case. So looking at page two, we've got H. pylori. Now this is a low level. I am very unlikely to treat H. pylori at this level in an eight month old. It is most commonly a commensal organism and possibly protective in this case against other atopic conditions. Normal flora here is, I would say it looks a little bit dysfunctional. So here we see it, for an eight month old, it can be very normal to not see acromantia and fecalobacterium, although we're hoping to see them around this age starting to creep in there. Um, fecalobacterium can really help with our carbohydrate fermentation and our anti-inflammatory status. Um, it's a big butyrate producer and we want it present. So acromantia as well is a big stimulator of the mucosal lining and mucin production. So those two are great for barrier function. When we see children with eczema, 
you're often looking at multiple barrier dysfunction. And so no matter what the test says, I will be working on barrier function in these children. Looking at clinical history first, testing second, and correlating everything. Um, at eight months, we are expecting to see a nice robust lactobacillus, so this is too low. That would be a target for treatment. We are generally expecting a bit more bacteroides fragilis than this. Um, so this can be normal-ish to see this a bit low. I would just want to see a little bit more, but probably not one of my biggest targets here, but lactobacillus would be a target. I may introduce some butyrate as an anti-inflammatory and some gut lining support. Now for Mickey's phylum, this is a level that can be considered really, really normal in a breastfed babe and somebody that has higher carbohydrates in the diet. So when we look at this page altogether, I would say gut lining support, um, butyrate, lactobacillus would be the interventions I would add here. Moving on to page three now, we're looking at opportunistic bacteria and I'm really just copied and pasted the relevant findings on this test, which I think was every section of this test. So this was a busy one. Now we see bacillus. I don't see a lot of correlations with bacillus and skin issues. It can be pretty common to see it at this level in a breastfed babe, so no concerns there. But the staph and strep here at these levels, at the E3 and E4 levels respectively, I see this so commonly in eczema. I'm just not surprised about it anymore, especially that staph can be really correlated with eczema. So adding in the lactobacillus can be helpful. You could consider an antimicrobial, but at eight months old, it's low on my list of interventions here. I do see a lot of practitioners using antimicrobials at this age. I am not one of them. Um, unless we treat and treat and treat for two, three months and nothing's changing, then maybe. And at that point, we've got a 10-month-old, so it's a little bit different. Now, methanobacteriaceae, again, it's colonized here. This is a fine level. Um, no concerns there. Now I've got the fungi and a couple of parasites posted here just to show some positive results here. We had a high candida, high blastocystis, both of which have a strong skin connection. So we've got a lot of organisms in this little person that are connected to skin and eczema. Not saying it's going to be everything, but it's definitely going to be something. Um, so when you look at the test, it's very tempting to use antimicrobials. And I might in the future, but at eight months, it wouldn't necessarily be my first approach. And it's okay if it's yours. Um, but not mine. So page four, we've got more page four here, our intestinal health. So here we see some lower digestive capacity. So a little bit of fat in the stool that may be a function of the dysbiosis. We've got lower elastase than what is optimal. So still I'm shooting for 500 here for elastase. So some digestive support would be helpful here. GI markers look normal. Secretory IgA, very low. So we've got a lot of organisms present. We've got low immunity. This low immunity could be the reason that we've got so many organisms colonizing and not moving on. So secretory IgA's job basically is to scavenge for anything non-self, non-normal, engulf and eliminate it. So this is our first line of defense in young people and it's not high enough. So I would be adding immune support. I see this also as a surrogate marker for epithelial cell health in some cases. And so working on barrier function and gut health would be really reasonable in the longer run here. Antigliadin IgA looks totally fine to me. Um, this person had not had gluten introduced at this point, but I don't remember what mother was doing for gluten. I would probably remove it as one of my first things for eczema from the maternal diet. And then calprotectin, we talked about calprotectin being normal to be high in the first year, so 210, yeah, that can be fine. And then in this person, maybe it's too much. We do see that low Fecalobacterium presnitzii, which is an organism that doesn't colonize well in inflammation. So maybe this inflammation is hindering the colonization of that nice protective species, and maybe it's not. So I wouldn't jump to do anything about that calprotectin. But in this case, looking clinically, I would be addressing gut health. I may add some anti-inflammatories. I would be likely to add butyrate. Now, breaking down the case, this is something that I think a lot of our clinicians struggle with, and I just I do it in a really simple way. So I write down the most relevant findings on a case. So we had our enterohemorrhagic E. coli. We had insufficiency dysbiosis. And by the way, insufficiency dysbiosis is one of our major causes for low secretory IgA as well. So getting that normal flora up can really help with the IgA. 
dysbiosis of staph strep candida and blastocystis and of course that e coli that we saw so a lot of dysbiosis low digestive capacity and low immunity and then some inflammation which may or may not be normal depending on the person and then after i break down the most important findings i prioritize so oh i did add inflammation there um Treatment priority, priorities here, with any eczema case, we're going to be supporting barrier function. That's going to be number one. Um, I like to do this with oils too. I like to use fish oils, flax oil. Um, I may be interested in glutamine, butyrate, collagen, things like that. Maybe some NAG. And then promote normal flora. So in this case, I would be likely to add in lactobacillus completely likely to add in lactobacillus and very likely to add in some Saccharomyces boulardii um, just because that's protective against candida and blastocystis and that's what we've got present. I would be supporting digestion and immunity so I would likely give some colostrum if it's tolerated, maybe some immunoglobulins, very likely to give a crushed up or chewable digestive enzyme but I wouldn't expect an eight month old to chew it competently so I'd probably grind that up and put it in a little bit of applesauce or on the food something like that we've got some really yummy tasting digestive enzymes that could be really helpful in this case I would do a trial food elimination in any case of eczema I would be eliminating food from both mom and babe and again my highest yield foods for most cases are dairy gluten eggs and then in eczema, sometimes it's citrus, sometimes it's nuts, sometimes it's fish. Um, so see what's reasonable. It's generally in my practice not reasonable to run a food sensitivity test on an eight month old. That is not something that I generally do. So I'm doing targeted food eliminations based on experience. Um, and do we manage the dysbiosis? That would be your call as the practitioner. In my case, no, I would go a good two months without actually killing the organisms present before I would think about moving in with some antimicrobials. I'm going to pause it there and check in with you, Heather, because we're at time. Okay, sounds good. Um, actually, we've run out of time today, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. For more information on testings offered by Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory, please visit our website at diagnosticsolutionslab.com. Thanks again, and everybody have a great day.